My name is Justin Gage, and you're tuned in to the Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions Podcast with your host, Jason Woodbury. Welcome back to another episode of Transmissions. My guest this week on the show is Yasmin Williams, who's got a new album of acoustic guitar songs out now called Urban Driftwood on Spinster Records. Yasmin joined me to talk about uh, being a black solo acoustic guitarist in a field that is primarily made up of of, uh, dudes, and usually white dudes. Um, So we got into some of that, kind of discussed the genre figurehead John Fahey's complicated history and uh, unpacked a little about the term American primitive music and and, uh, kind of came up with, I think, with some other ways to think about how we classify this stuff. I really enjoyed having Yasmin on, so without further ado, let's get into our conversation. Remember, if you want to support Aquarium Drunkard Transmissions, the best thing you can do is share our broadcast with someone you think might enjoy it. And if you want to take your support just a little further, you can check us out on Patreon, too. All right, let's head into my conversation with Yasmin Williams, whose new album, Urban Driftwood, is out now. All right, Yasmin, thanks so much for taking the time to join us here on Aquarium Drunkard's Transmissions. It's a real treat to have you here. I love the new the new album. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, it's a really cool collection of stuff. And uh, it, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like you've got all these different sounds going, primarily mm. a- acoustic bass. But I wanted to start off by asking you, you kind of started off more on electric, right? Uh, was electric? Yeah, for sure. Electric guitar mm-hmm. after after beating Guitar Hero Two yeah. on Expert. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So I beat the game, and my parents bought me an electric guitar because that's what I wanted. I basically wanted to be like a shredder type person. When you say a shredder, do you mean like like Ingve like, Malmsteam or, or that kind of stuff? Well, maybe not to that. Well, kind of <laughs> like Paul Gilbert or like Buckethead and like all of those type of people. Do you still listen to some of that stuff? Not really them. I used to be a kind of a metalhead too, and I still listen to metal on occasion, but my tastes have kind of like are less angsty now <laughs> than they were in middle school. Sure. I mean that makes that makes plenty <laughs> that makes plenty of sense. Um Right. How did the shift to acoustic guitar happen for you? Basically I couldn't live out my dream of being Paul Gilbert, so I kinda had to switch it up. And <laughs> like basically well also I, at first, I thought of acoustic guitar as kind of like a songwriter type thing, like you kind of play four chords on it, and that was kind of all it could do, which is why I didn't really care for it. But then I learned the song Blackbird by the Beatles, which um, introduced me to fingerstyle stuff, and that's like kind of did it for me. Yeah, I kind of pretty much kind of dropped the electric guitar for a while and just dove right into fingerstyle playing and percussive playing. I discovered that um, eventually. How did you uh do do you do you ever still play electric now though? Do you do you pull it up? Oh yeah, sure. I'm starting to play a lot more now actually. That that's um, awesome. I feel cuz I cuz yeah. like listening to this record, it's so clear Urban Driftwood that you're like you're open to all sorts of augmentation and that it doesn't need to just be there are moments where it is just kind of like a single acoustic yeah. guitar on the record but then there's also a lot of layering and a lot of percussion elements and so i found myself yeah, exactly. thinking about how uh i know over the the, the summer you did a, a thing at big ears with marissa anderson mm-hmm. and william tyler both who have been on this podcast and they kind of are two artists who switch a lot between acoustic and electric yeah. and i was like I, I i'm interested to hear where you might go in a more electric direction potentially if that's something you're sounds like that's something you're into yeah yeah, it is. And also just collaborating in general, whether it's with acoustic or electric, I'm definitely trying to do more of that because it just lets me kind of sharpen my composer tools, you know, 
And instead of getting kind of stuck in solo acoustic guitar stuff, it's nice to be able to branch out and kind of be more open and, um, yeah, just give myself the opportunities to write more music um, for more instruments and ensembles and stuff. Yeah. You, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the sort of like early conception you had of acoustic guitar as like a singer song, a yeah. singer songwriter <laughs> thing. Uh, did you, did you try singing and writing lyrics too at first? Because the thing that's interesting about this record is that between the titles and the notes, you know, it does feel like the storytelling aspect of what you're doing is still a really big part of your approach. And so I just, thank you. I just, I yeah. wonder, you know, like, how do you, how, how do how do you conceive? How does a, has an artist say like, well, I want to make lyrical music minus lyrics, you know? I mean, that's pretty much what it is. Um, I guess for me, lyrics aren't, they don't come naturally. Um, I mean, I sang choir when I was little and, you know, but it's not something, I guess I kind of just speak through the guitar or through whatever instrument I'm playing as a composer than a lyricist. And the titles is just how I kind of, since to me titles are very important, um, it's just kind of how I show the path of the album and show, I don't want to influence in the audience or the listener into thinking a certain way or something because of the title, but it's just kind of like a guide into so the listener knows how what I was thinking about when I wrote the track. And, you know, a lot of times I don't even name my songs. Um, sometimes fans name them. Sometimes other people, friends name them. And yeah. How, how often do you have like just the demo, the demo title, whatever you call it in that moment. And that just carries through to become the actual album or the song title. The only one I can think of is on my first record. There's a song on there called song for Alex. And that's that that's, <laughs> that was the demo title. <laughs> Other than that, no, never. Yeah. It's usually just like number a thousand or something. It's not really a title. <laughs> sure. Well, the title of the album is interesting, Urban Driftwood. You know, mm -hmm. um, I feel like that word urban is a particularly complex one for a black artist. It is, to, yeah. To employ. And I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about where, you know, where the title comes from and what it means to you. So urban, urban driftwood means a lot, particularly urban, you're correct. Um, I did want to kind of imply a blackness in that. Um, not saying that all black artists are urban, that's exactly what I'm you know, not saying. <laughs> but I kind of wanted it to be in there just to show that I am a black artist in a non-black genre, pretty much, you know. Even though the history of the genre is very black, you know, right now it's kind of mainly like you know, I get John Fahey comparisons a lot and a lot of comparisons to white male uh, guitarists, but that's an aspect of it. Um, also urban driftwood. I kind of wanted to, that's kind of a dichotomy there. The album's very nature inspired. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to kind of show that there is a lot of nature in urban spaces. Um, even with my music video for urban driftwood, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's very, um, kind of naturey, even though it was shot in Baltimore, in the city of Baltimore. Um, we found a lot of cool nature shots there, and I wanted to showcase that. And even to my guitar, it's very, <laughs> my guitar is very weird looking. It's full of kind of nature impl implications, like the back of it's made out of spalted tamarind, which is a fungus, and the front of it is like made out of wood that mollusks burrowed into, so there's holes in the front. And yeah, it, the name is pretty important and kind of has several meanings. Those are just a few of them. To, to me, that it's so it's so interesting because there's there's like a tendency, especially with something like solo acoustic guitar, to mm -hmm. to come up with the so, what I what I like about the implication is first and foremost, n nature and cities. You know, they're mm -hmm. they don't one doesn't really end when the other begins, and that's a a way right. that we often. I mean, I'm yeah. guilty of that too, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, when you use, you know, rural, rural as a, as a designator, you right. know, but it's like, mm -hmm. there are spaces, you know, within our cities that, that, that mm -hmm. nature comes through regardless of our, our yeah. plan. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really interesting. And, and then I think about how, yeah, exactly. To imply the, I mean... I'm sure that somebody out there is going to is going to see the title and they're going to imagine that there's going to be beats on the record, you know, and there, I mean, there are. are rhythms <laughs> for sure. But you but you liked the idea of sort of like, I feel like it's a very playful sort of thing to do to sort of like play with these conceptions of, of what that's exactly what I was doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
And I thought it was even, I thought it was kind of funny, especially in this genre where it's very like, quote unquote, American primitive is the thing. And to me, that's a whole other problem. But it's just nice to kind of pick with that and pick with people's expectations. Because even with reviews of the album, there's so many that say, oh, I don't know, I wasn't really expecting this. When you hear a solo guitar record, you don't really expect to hear drums and you don't expect to hear like urban influences or hip hop influences or whatever, which is great. Um, you know, I, that's what I want to showcase. So I, I I do want to get into the idea of you know American primitive and 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 what mm. and what that could you, could you tell me what it is that I mean I, I the the I think the bio refers to you, you refer to as it is a problematic designation and I wonder yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that sure yeah so basically as I see it it's not real even the name American primitive is kind of a problem because you're implying a certain style of music that the genre takes from heavily, which is blues, um, but basically just music that's associated with black musicians is somehow primitive, which is not correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot um, into playing blues, which is why I rarely play it. It's, it's pretty difficult. It's not really primitive at all. Um, and just kind of having that Messiah figure in John Fahey is another problem because there's lots of, quote unquote American primitive artists that are that are great. Um, but he's he was also problematic and it's kind of not great that he's the figurehead for such a um a movement as that. It's um, yeah. There's a lot of <laughs> I could go on. No, I mean I think that that's such a great point. I mean, so you know, the the idea of like how what was Fahey trying to say is something that's I think is is interesting because yeah. he I think what he was and i don't, I don't want to cut him too much credit because i feel like he just didn't really know any better well uh, um, yeah and i kind of <laughs> like he just you know back in his time that was just how he whether that's how he grew up or that's how he experienced race relations or wasn't taught any better or something but you know i don't put it all on him but it, i put it on him in terms of us kind of giving him a godlike figure in the genre well so so certainly to me it was when I first discovered Fahey records, I felt like I didn't know this, you know, because it, it takes a long time. It right. takes a long time to figure this out. But what I didn't know was the way he was sort of um, he was he was almost sort of distilling various approaches into this thing, you know, mm -hmm. and and uh, and unfortunately, this weird thing that happened that that shouldn't have happened in my I guess or maybe it should have maybe there's no avoiding it was that his thing became the template for it where whereas yeah whereas like perhaps what he could what when you listen to somebody like Robbie Basho you know you hear somebody mm -hmm. who who uh has some of the similar reference points as Fahey but then he's willing to take it other other places and right and the fact that these two people were considered as sharing a genre was just the music industry sort of doing what it always does, which is yeah. saying, well, yeah, these two things yeah. are kind of similar, you know? Uh, right. That's why I don't put it all on him, per se. Sure, sure. But it's still a problem, you know? Uh, but we're growing past that, especially with modern, quote-unquote, American... They're not really American primitive to me, but they're considered that, like Daniel Bachman and Jack Rose and younger people. Um, we're moving past these... Um, uh, kind of problems in the genre but I, you know. well i think so i mean and obviously your record your record is part of that too which is this this expanding of the stuff and to me when we get to the little bit like the later stuff you know you hear that like somebody like jack rose uh you know was bringing in all sorts of other sounds too S yeah for sandy sure. bowl almost immediately becomes like that and then you get mm -hmm. all of the windham hill guys which yeah for sure when i was getting into this stuff I that was a dividing line like that wasn't cool the Wyndham Hill stuff was was not cool the oh you know like uh American primitive music that's cool you know because huh. be, I didn't know that was a thing <laughs> I don't know it, it was it was probably just because Thurston Moore chose to like one of them okay. versus the other but um all respect to Thurston but I think about how you know like so what was Fahey maybe trying to do and it seems like he was implying this idea of of unlearned or or untutored or uns you know not like not music yeah. studies but then 
that's also a little bit of a weird misnomer because yeah because it it is learned it's learned out exactly. it's learned outside of certain institutions you know yeah that doesn't make it mean it's any less valid though which is my whole problem with him and the genre itself because because you're talking about the kind of learning that might be done in a in a less scholastic or academic sense exactly but but you have you've done both right i mean you kind of funnily <laughs> enough yeah yep <laughs> yep <laughs> done both in an extreme sense when when you started studying at like at nyu did did you have to unlearn certain things uh, uh that you had developed in your own sort of more self-taught playing and then has any of that come back into the playing as as you've kind of continued on it's actually a really cool question um unlearn no because my ear is was extremely important in college. <laughs> right. And we all obviously had ear training classes and which also helped me in theory classes, which yeah, I was pretty well prepared even though I wasn't really great with music theory coming in. I picked up on it very quickly because of how good my ear was from just teaching myself things, I guess, in a good way. <laughs> um but I have had to kind of unlearn things since graduating. Or not unlearn, but use what I learned in the best way for my music, you know, not focusing so heavily on theory, which, you know, was my degree and kind of not relying on that. And in instead relying on the theory in terms of like, it's given me a better intuition, if that makes sense to know what to put into my music or how to write better music. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't, it's like a subconscious thing instead of a conscious thing. Sure. If that makes sense. Well, sure. I mean, <laughs> when, when I was thinking, you know, as I, as I listened to the record and as I sort of read through the the notes and the bio stuff, mm -hmm. you know, you, you wrote, you worked on Ur Urban Driftwood a lot over 2020, which, you know, yeah. is, let's say, not a normal year um, in a lot of, yeah, for sure. in, in pretty much every, every single way. <laughs> every way. <laughs> um, but, you know, like uh, uh, some of the stuff like Adrift, you know, you were specifically referencing and sort of processing sort of what we were seeing on a national scale in terms of you know black lives matter protests and mm -hmm. uh the general you know uh the the general feeling of of yeah. our last year which was like what is what is the society that we have right now because it yeah it's... for sure crazy <laughs> and and i wondered you know as you're you know you're drawing emotional content from from these things and i wondered you know if we could get back into that idea of lyricism, you know, how do you feel mm -hmm. like the sound relates to the idea? And then I, I guess what I'm saying is when you're performing that stuff, I mean, are you thinking about things or is it more like something maybe a little bit more alchemical where it's not exactly thinking about themes, but more or less trying to, you know, uh, point towards them musically i just i think that like when i'm performing or writing well let's start with writing because it's probably okay. two well, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> when i'm writing definitely i'm thinking about themes and just well this album in particular was just kind of me digesting the year which is kind of probably why i decided to use tunes that i wrote a long time ago like swift breeze i wrote in high school the framework of it mm. and reworked it for this but um, it kind of caused me to think back to when I first started playing and when I first started writing songs and how I felt then and how I was processing everything in 2020. And I also kind of wanted to show that, well, more show myself than anyone else that I have grown as a musician. And I kind of, if I'm going to put out an album, especially after a year like this, I want to do the best that I can and show the, my growth in the best way possible, um, which is where all the other instruments came from. But when performing these songs, it's not, I'm more detached. I don't, well, I don't want to say detached, but I'm not thinking about how I was feeling when I was writing them. I'm more just thinking about just showcasing the song to the best of my ability. Um, and that particular night, you know, sure, sure. <laughs> and, 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 and I letting it go maybe new places in your head, exactly, which, is, which yeah. has to be important, I guess, if you're going to keep performing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. What, what were, you know, when when thinking about your music sort of in terms of genre um it does feel a little bit more drawn to the 
Wyndham Hill side of things to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. In terms of some of the, certainly the melodic interplay. And then I think also, I mean, you know, your, your first your first record um, was called, uh, wait, I'm sorry. Unwind. Un- yeah, okay. And, and, <laughs> and, and so and so I wonder, do you think about the idea that maybe the listener can use your music in in a way to to calm themselves oh, yeah. down? I mean, yeah, for sure. That's that's definitely a goal of mine. Yeah. Um, with both albums, really. Uh, plus my music, I guess, I don't really know why, but it just kind of has, I guess, a relaxing quality about it anyway. Like, even I could play you voice memos that have not been released or anything, and it it sounds pretty similar to what (laughs) is actually released. Um, So I don't don't really know why, but I guess that's just how I kind of... I guess that's just my style and how I process things. I would love to hear a collection of your your uh, of your of your phone uh, vo- voice memos. I have like a thousand voice memos. <laughs> just little little sound. Clips. I think we ju- I think I think we just launched your next band Bandcamp Friday release, right? One thousand. No, wait, that's a good idea though. <laughs> that's a good idea. Hold on. Okay. Well, l- listen, I, I'm full of them. Uh, <laughs> um but one thing that I was thinking about though is the is the is the is the fact that like to me w- you know when I've interviewed new age musicians they're like I, yeah. I I made this for people to have something that is either going to you know calm them down help them unplug help them mm-hmm. you know process uh, this is Yeah I don't really think of that I mean I don't write things for well, I do, but I don't. <laughs> like, I guess with this album, this was just kind of... I wanted to release an album at some point. I knew that. I said this in, I think, 2019. Nothing was really done, though. So I was just more kind of just putting it to the air. Um, I didn't expect to write the album so quickly <laughs> um, or to have that much time to write it. Sure. But, uh, yeah, it was just mainly for me to kind of process my emotions. And I knew after hearing the completed tracks or the completed demos that... Okay, yeah, this will probably help someone else. Um, I knew I had something. I didn't know to what extent. You know, I wasn't really thinking about that, but I thought it was worth putting out. So I guess it's kind of both things. Like, I do think about other the audience or other people, but also, you know, myself and how I feel. Does does the... Um, did, did you have... Re- what are some records that, for you, have sort of served those kinds of purposes in terms of, you know, when when, when you need to... Yeah. To wind that un- so, unwind, yeah. I'm just still referencing 2020 because that's <laughs> I definitely needed to unwind a lot there. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It hasn't yeah, 2021 is yeah. going to be another year where and we have to this year too. Yeah, Tom, I'm acting like 2020 is the only. Yeah, this year too. <laughs> um Daniel Bachman, I listened to a lot of him. Mm-hmm. Uh he's all of his albums are great. It's one of the greats, yeah. Um yeah, I listen to a lot of Vinyl Williams. Um, he's kind of psychedelic, kind of amazing. He's just great. Uh, a lot of people. Uh, Bethany Curve, a lot of shoegaze, some hip hop. Um, you know, like just Jay Dilla beats are always good when you need them. New job bass. Um Yeah, my tastes are kind of all over the place. Like Dive, I listen to a lot of them. I listen to a lot of um, Adrian Lenker, a lot of everybody <laughs> yeah that's awesome that's awesome i think that that you know the windham hill guys you know um they 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 were interested i think in in creating music that was more intentional in its in its use or at least op- open to that, its yeah. use. but i also hear something similar in yours and i think it doesn't come from because that wasn't stuff that you really grew up listening to at all right not at all no I- I grew up listening to a lot of, you know, rap, common, Warren G, you know, uh, jazz, smooth jazz. It's soul, you know. So to me, smooth jazz, you know. Um, yeah, that was a big one. I think about how, and I don't know exactly what the formatting wise, you know, if like smooth jazz and and kind of quiet storm R and B, and like yes. and like new age. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, to me, I feel like we're just talking about similar. Uh, we are not 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 yeah. the exact same thing obviously yeah. you know but like 
sure. jo- you know George Winston or whatever. It's like eventually, like it's just it, well, mm-hmm. it's jazz, and it's like, well, why is this one jazz, but this other thing is new age? Anyway, I think that that it's an interesting kind of thing, but I I I, I keyed in on that smooth jazz part of things mm-hmm. because your music doesn't sound like that but it has mm-hmm. maybe you're willing to play i think it has a similar quality yeah for sure tonalities and, and stuff was, right yeah yeah i mean i'm much more inspired by that than say you know the american primitive tradition because i i didn't i don't i still really don't know much about it um i've been diving in a little bit more but i mean i grew up with smooth jazz go-go with regional music in dc um, just things with beats, you know, funk, all of that. So I'm definitely, even subconsciously, I pull from that lineage more so than the one I think people would expect me to say I pull from, um, which is great. But yeah, smooth jazz is definitely huge. Even before I was born, a lot of my parents always played that when I was on the way and <laughs> after I was born. So I definitely, that might be why I play guitar. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> There's a ton of guitar in that. <laughs> what do your parents think about your music? My mom for sure thinks smooth jazz is the reason I play guitar. <laughs> My dad too. Yeah. But um, yeah, they they think it's great. My whole family. And it's funny because it's definitely not something that they would really listen to or even really knew about. But they've. I, that's why I agree with you in terms of saying smooth jazz and new age or whatever you want to call it are pretty similar. And um, I think audiences of both can appreciate the other. Audience of one can appreciate the other. Um, if they knew about it, you know. Sure. Sure. Do you feel like when 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 you first got interested in music, um, was there any of that uh, that that feeling of of wanting to process and unwind when when you first got interested in music, or were, were no. you because you, you, you mentioned being a little more <laughs> angsty, right? Yeah. No, there was no problem. No, that wasn't the thing. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Well, I guess it was like playing guitar, even though I was playing like Iron Iron Man and Jimi Hendrix and whatever else I was playing. Not necessarily relaxing, but it relaxed me because it was a skill that I wanted to get better at. And it was, I just really enjoyed playing. I never had a day where I didn't want to play. It was never, it never felt like a chore. Um, it, it was always just something fun. So yeah, it relaxed me in that way. But yeah, the music that I wanted to make or play was not <laughs> relaxing, <laughs> but that really didn't last too long. It lasted for like a year before I started writing my own tunes. And I noticed that, yeah, my style's a lot different than what I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Did you have people who you sort of idolized, uh, you know, post listening to a lot of Sabbath or whatever, as you started to to kind of <laughs> hone in more on your your uh, your own voice? Were there people yeah. that sort of served as reference points? It's funny. Uh, not really. Um, I was very tunnel visioned. I didn't really care about learning other people's music at all mm. then. I was very much focused on, okay, and I really don't know why, but I was very focused on just writing my own things. Um, I didn't really start playing covers when I learned acoustic guitar until recently, maybe a couple years ago was when I kind of got into that. Um, Yeah, I didn't really have any idols, I guess, when I started acoustic guitar. I, it's kind of weird. You would expect me to. I would expect myself to. <laughs> but now it's kind of um, changing. I definitely love Elizabeth Cotton. She's kind of an idol. Yeah, she's incredible. Um, yeah, Algia May Hinton. And I probably would have had idols back then if I had known of these people and found people who sh- I thought shared my lineage or looked more like me or I had something in common with. It's kind of difficult to have idols that I, I felt were kind of unreachable or I don't know. Um, sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so I, I know, I know Hendrix was, was big for you, but I mean, I have to imagine that seeing somebody like sister Rosetta Tharp or something would have just right. would have probably, you know, flipped you out even more. Yeah. Just, I mean, I didn't see her until maybe college. Well, yeah. Same. I mean, I think <laughs> same same here. So, yeah, it took it took really yeah. getting into records and stuff to find find some of that stuff. But I but I yeah. but also there's such a technical aspect of of what you do. Were were you mm. were you running like were you doing exercises? Did you get into alternate tunings <laughs> that young too? I mean, yeah, I did. Um, probably a year after I started playing, maybe a year and a half, I just got tired of standard standard tuning and just electric guitar in general, and just really wanted to 
I thought there was something more. <laughs> so yeah. I kind of just found it myself. I don't, I think I Google alternate tunings or just kind of retune my guitar to something I thought sounded good. And yeah, I haven't really used standards since playing electric really when um, when, I, when i was young i uh wanted to learn guitar stuff too and i and i was like always a pretty technic mm-hmm. technically bad player in a lot of ways um but i but alternate tunings were like the ultimate trick you know what i mean like right it's like yeah like, all of a sudden people were like oh, you're so good at guitar and i was still i know i was still playing terror same <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds impressive you can't i think i liked it at first when i first started playing because it's just hard to sound bad like i I discovered open d which oh, is yeah. just a d chord yeah <laughs> it's like i had to go to school with my guitar I just carry it around and just strum that and people are like oh my god you know, i'm like i'm not doing anything well well sure do you do you, <laughs> do you think that that you know uh w- by the time you you start studying it more intently yeah did you start to recognize certain like things that you had picked up almost innately just because the cool thing about an open tuning is that it, it does it, it it kind of is in a weird way a little box around what you're playing, you know, because mm-hmm. because some of the uh, ambiguities have, or not ambiguities, y- your possibilities are a little more limited in a, in one sense, but then you end up, yeah. but then you yeah. end up kind of figuring out things that work that are generally, I would imagine, by the time you start studying more intensely, you're like, well, I was already doing this without knowing I was doing this, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, apparently, I really like chord extensions and open chords and ninth chords and open tunings work great for that. Yeah. I didn't know that when I first started playing, obviously. But yeah, like when college comes around and I'm like, oh, I, I should analyze why my music is the way it is, <laughs> because I can do that <laughs> now. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty interesting to see the results of that. But um, yeah, alternate tunings were a breakthrough for me, too. It really just kind of heightened everything. Um, where I kind of felt trapped in standard tuning because it just it just didn't fit my songwriting really. Um, right, right. You know? Yeah, I, I said put a box around it, and I and I guess what I mean to, yeah, I, I, I feel like I phrased that slightly incorrect, but in a weird way, it, it enforces some sort of parameters that give, that give yeah, you a way to then. It's, I think that's why I liked it as a beginner. Because it does do that. For sure. Um, I don't have to worry about switching keys. I don't have to worry about a lot of things. Um, you know, I can play a chord that sounds great and lush with two fingers instead of four or whatever you need in standard. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's definitely true. How soon, at what point did you start playing around more with, with the rhythmic aspect of it? Because on your records, not... O- that was early too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not not <laughs> yeah. only is there the, is there the tapping element of it, you know, mm-hmm. but I mean, obviously, sometimes you employ the the guitar on your lap. You've got, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, a kalimba. Uh, you've got all yeah. these different, you know, uh, like a, a amplified box, tap shoes, all this, all this <laughs> stuff. You know, Th- that was early early yeah. on though. You you immediately the the lap tapping and the um, like percussive stuff. Yeah, yeah. I released an EP in high school in 2012, and that features some uh it has electric guitar on it which was kind of like my last like rock thing (laughs) that i released but also it has a lot of acoustic tracks that have percussion in them i played lap tapping style on that and that was you know almost 10 years ago so yeah yeah it was pretty early on yeah um yeah i just kind of went full throttle really (laughs) like i didn't really care about what anyone else was doing i just i guess i kind of established what i wanted to do in my style early on and i've just been kind of gradually getting better at it you know the longer i play you you've got guests on this record a few uh people play along with you but early on yeah. w- were you was it all was music generally a pretty solitary uh it was only yeah it was i mean yeah i would be in i'd play songs with friends or you know be in a little band or two or whatever but like music that i was serious about was all solitary it was all solo um because it was just easier for me I didn't working with other people at that point I wasn't really too keen on because it just required more effort and it it's just a lot easier to kind of have something I can play myself you know for shows for logistics for you know everything but now it's kind of I guess I've gotten to the point where I can be confident enough in my abilities to now want to branch out and play with other people who are really good at whatever they play or sing or whatever sure sure when when you were playing stuff primarily on your own, I mean, I know that it it, it must have uh, 
instilled in you a need to be able to figure out how to make a thing work you know exactly for sure that's literally why i do any of this (laughs) like the kalimba thing is just that well i got that idea from earth wind and fire um their kalimba story song but i wanted to do that because you know only playing guitar can get kind of draining in terms of you know your ear you want to hear something new a new timbre whatever so i kind of and i chose kalimba because it's small and because it sounds nice but um yeah yeah just like different timbre things i just i had to kind of pick up a lot even with the tap shoes with my hands are busy you know i had the idea to use my feet because i'm still playing by myself you know i don't have a drummer to do it so yeah yeah there's a lot of problem solving that comes with playing by yourself and wanting to expand <laughs> your instruments and your music does does but it sounds it like i i feel like a lot of uh players would would um lean away from the problem solve the problem solve they would, for sure <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why that was easier for me <laughs> than to let's be like hey whatever friend play play drums on this like i, I just didn't want to do that yeah yeah um, did you ever feel, yeah i don't know i mean for you do you i mean are you trying to capture something that already exists in your head to some degree uh when when you're when you're doing this and is that part of maybe why you would maybe feel more comfortable mm. tinkering kind of in a way on your own yeah. and building it from that as opposed to sort of being like here's what i want you to play on the drums you know yeah. and then i'm gonna do this you, you, it, it seems to me like that makes a lot of sense but no <laughs> usually it, it no i didn't really have an idea per se like i knew usually it's I know like what sound I want, which is why I use a hammer sometimes or why I use tap shoes instead of a MIDI trigger or why I use something, you know, whatever. Um, But I don't necessarily have a strict idea or any idea really of what exactly, like what rhythms or notes I want to play. Um, And it's just easier for me to experiment, I guess, by myself. Because at the end of the day, I don't really need to worry about, can this person do this? How will this sound? I know how it'll sound because I, I did it. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I guess that level of control was important to me, especially early on. Yeah. That sounds, I mean, that's a really interesting, and, and, and I mean, I think that probably there's a certain kind of like approach where, where somebody learns by doing as opposed to you know uh exactly. as opposed to like mm-hmm. saying here's what it is now i'm going to and i think that probably certainly for a solo artist you know a primarily solo mm-hmm. artist you know it, it's almost like a collaboration with a part of you that you don't know yet in a weird way it is yeah that's exactly what it is um but I'm trying to, and well, at first I wasn't really okay with even going in the studio for my first album. The, the album was basically done. I just had to record it. All the songs were written, they're all written out and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, this album, I, I just kind of wanted to be more flexible, a bit more loose. And even though most of the songs were still pretty much done, I had demos for them. Like when Amadou came in, the drummer for on Urban Driftwood, I sent him like a framework of what I wanted him to play, and he kind of just improvised over it. Before, I wouldn't have been okay with that, probably. <laughs> but um, now it's just like, you know, there's so many dope, talented artists out here, and I can't play everything, and I can't play most things as well. So why not use other people? Um, yeah, and I can also just use other musical skills that I have. Like for Adrift, I wrote the cello part, and I had Taryn, the cellist, come in, and she played it great. And it's just more rewarding, I guess. I find that more rewarding now than kind of being the, the one woman band and um which is still cool. I'm not saying that's not cool. It's that's so primarily the thing. Sure. But um, sure. Yeah. It's just more rewarding to work with other people. There's an interesting thing that happens where uh, on on the record you're using you know, it 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 often sounds like there are some effects and some production work at, at play. But I cool. it, is is it more <laughs> Uh, sort of you know microphone based and and layering yeah. of of acoustic instruments to naturally achieve things that maybe the average person yes. you throw a little reverb on there and you're like done <laughs> yeah so the engineer uh, definitely jeff was very 
<laughs> that was a whole other thing. Like, I definitely did things that I wasn't used to. Like, with my first album, Unwind, that was very, like, if I didn't get it in a take, there was no way. I didn't overdub anything because I just, I refused to. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I mess something up, I'd have to redo the whole song. Um, this one, you know, I was kind of more okay with overdubbing and layering and seeing what would happen and having him try different mics and different techniques and spatialization things. And it turned, turned out great, but, um, yeah, just giving up the, a uh, little bit of control and just letting the people who know what they're doing, do what they do best is something that I'm learning to do and something that's very rewarding. Um, and it just makes it easier for me too. <laughs> well, what is, what, what does it allow you to focus on that previously, yeah, exactly. that previously maybe you wouldn't have, you know? I didn't have to focus on being perfect in the studio, which was huge. Um, If I mess something up, I can just, you know, it's easy to just redo that little part instead of redoing the whole thing, especially now that I had so many instruments like a Cora, kalimbas, guitars, like three guitars I brought in, um, taps and other people coming in. Yeah, it just let me focus more on the music and just getting the best take, the most emotional take, just being in the element of Mm -hmm. what I do best instead of just kind of focusing on everything sure. all at once. Yeah. Do you feel like, um, you know, when you approach things that way, is there any fear that like, well, now what, what happens when I have to do this live? Or did you just sort of say, there? I'm not going to worry about that for right now or whatever? I just pretty much said, screw <laughs> it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is what it is. And I don't want live performances to dictate my music since I mean, it, it. it's funny you mentioned that because that's definitely was a fear for my first album, which is why the songs are songs I can play myself. Um, because also I was just starting out and like, you know, it made more sense for me to have, when doing shows, have things that only I need to play, you know. Um, but now it's not really a concern anymore. I just wanted to write the best music I could. And a lot, I mean, there's always backing tracks or, you know, whatever, <laughs> bring in guest artists or, you know, I can make it work. Well, <laughs> have more experience now. Sure, and it's also you know you mentioned that maybe you didn't want to let the live thing dictate what happens in the studio, yeah. and then I guess you know do you do you envision it working the 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 inverse as well, where you're not going to necessarily need the studio to dictate what happens in future live performances? Do the songs sort of feel like as as far as you know what what level of like imp- improvisation is now starting to to be at work in terms of, of right? Stuff? That's a good question. I've been thinking about it. I'm still thinking about that. Um, that's another kind of comfort hurdle I have to <laughs> jump. Uh, I'm very kind of used to playing. Once a song is kind of recorded, it's I change little things here and there, but the song format is pretty much done. Mm-hmm. Um, not too big on improvising my own stuff because it what I want is done. Um, but I'm kind of becoming more open to the idea, especially for this album of just having kind of a live sound or a live set that may be different from the studio album. Um, you know, who knows, but yeah, it's definitely something I'm thinking about. When when you like, when you teamed up with Marissa Anderson and William Tyler, had, had the three of you met and had any sort of di- direction discussed or was it more of a, you show up and you just kind of see what happens? <laughs> we basically just i mean they know each other very well because they recorded an album together and yeah but i just kind of showed up <laughs> was like hey guys nice to meet you and they're they're so nice like they made it so easy um even with the three of us playing uh we kind of decided to play those songs day of in the the live stream we did um and yeah they just made it super simple for me to just kind of join in and play the duets and they were yeah, I just showed up. I don't know what they did. I think we all just showed up pretty much. It was very like improvisation based. Yeah, yeah. Which was cool. Is that an area where maybe not with your own music you've done that as much, but have you done that sort of outside the context of your, your record? Yeah. You've played a lot with other people? Yeah, I'm a lot more comfortable doing that with other people for whatever reason than doing it with my own stuff. I guess because since it's my own stuff, I feel like I should have complete control over what people hear consistently i feel like it should match even though it doesn't really have to i mean you know it's i guess it might be more fun for an audience who's aware of the studio recording to hear something different live um but yeah with other people i'm definitely open to improving and it's just more fun too yeah with doing it with other people 
Do you, um, do you feel like, I mean, obviously, you know, you're a technically, you know, you're like, you're a shredder basically as you, as you had. I am. I am? Oh, yeah, thank you've, you. You've made it. You've made it. Uh, you're a shredder. You know, that's amazing. Do you, do you, do you feel like you would be open to, you know, some singer songwriters like, Hey, I, I need, uh, some guitar on, on this. Yeah, thing. I've done that. Yeah. I released the track with my friend, Jason Bambury. He sings on it. Um, I approached him with the guitar thing was like, I feel like this needs lyrics and vocals. And he was like, for sure. And he wrote, he wrote what he sang in like a sitting and yeah, that's kind of the only release thing I have. Um, the song is called take that step, but I definitely want to do more of that. Yeah. Um, because that was really fun, but just little little steps <laughs> for right now. Sure. Well, you've already got you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. You just this is just your second your second solo record. Right. <laughs> like there's so much that, that I'm thinking about, and it's I just kind of have to, you know, Do, baby steps. When when you when you compare, you know, uh, I'm sure you don't sit around listening to your own music all the time, but you do have to listen to it a lot when you're making it. Um, yeah, for sure. What, what kind of difference do you hear uh, in you as a player uh, in terms of, of this new record from from the previous? Because to me, it sounds like there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of like maturing that you hear. And it's and it's just such mm-hmm. a, you know, but I, it already was really uh, it was already very technically right. precise to begin with. But yeah, I hear like there's a lot. What do you hear in terms of your own playing that you feel like you can kind of recognize uh some shifts yeah i feel like both albums served or both albums showcased me at my best at the time they were released and they showcase my frame of mind uh very well with unwind i was very kind of hyper aware of what i wanted to achieve with the album which was kind of it's it was an introduction basically Mm -hmm. to me as a guitarist and the type of music that I liked and the type of music that I wrote, um, I kind of just wanted to showcase my skills, I guess, in a way. And I kind of had to since I was very, um, I basically, I kind of forced myself to play the songs by myself. So I kind of had to um, show skills in that sense and to be able to play everything. Um, but this album, I just kind of wanted it to, yeah, maturity is a good word. I wanted to showcase maybe new skills as a guitarist, but that wasn't really the main thing. I was more focused on the composition aspect and just writing good songs. Since a lot of times in the genre, um, people can be very flashy, but it's not, the songs aren't necessarily uh, something you may want to (laughs) hear over and over again, Um, which, yeah, I kind of wanted to buck that trend and show that, yeah, you know, you can have a whole album like with a theme and songs and it sounds good. And I mean, yeah, it's technically precise and all of that. The playing is technical, but I was more concerned about the overall ambiance of the album and the theme and how the songs were composed. Yeah. So I guess that's like growth. <laughs> well, well, sure. And then also sort of just a willingness to like, uh, uh, it sounds like maybe take things apart just slightly to see yeah. how you could put them back together a little bit more. Yeah, definitely for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even I kind of listen to listening back to my first album now. It's very, I love it, but it's very kind of like I don't know. I, I guess with this album, it just meshes well. Like the songs are just they make more sense um, together. It's kind of like more of an i don't i don't really know more of an album or more of like an overall experience yeah if that makes sense whereas the first album is is great too but it's kind of like yeah i don't know it just showcases me at a different time in my life and my thought process of me being a musician you know do you think that do you think that the year in which it was created uh impacted the way that you thought about it or maybe just like you said you had time to think about it in a way that maybe you hadn't previously? Yeah, I think, I think the year I wrote most, I wrote the album in was, it caused me to reflect a lot on myself, um, my career, how I want to be known. And also I was hyper aware that this was a second album and a lot of times sophomore albums 
don't <laughs> um you try to kind of recreate the magic of the first one and i didn't really want to do that yeah. i don't want to get stuck there um so i realized that kind of a lot was riding on this but not in like a pressure way just kind of like i wanted to prove to myself that i could show a different side of me and more and show more of who i am as a black artist as a black art, female artist in a genre that's doesn't have many black females in it and have the music kind of transcend that and have people enjoy it and um yeah i think i think i did that the best i could <laughs> yeah i mean i do too it's a great record so <laughs> you've got, you've got you, you you absolutely <laughs> pull, pulled that off there's just a lot of like there's a lot kind of to explain with this record since even just, i'm still kind of shocked at how much i put into it like the different themes um but do you, i guess 2020 is a year for that so. i mean do you do you, do you feel like <laughs> Do you get the sense having done interviews and put this stuff out there and had reviews and all and all this stuff, yeah. you know, do you get the sense that there's a there's more of a willingness to have the kind of conversations that you want to have right now? I mean, I'm Oh, for sure. Yeah, I do. Um even when I put out my first album and had to do interviews with that, that I was never really asked about how I felt as a, you know, black guitarist or a black female or anything. Um, the questions were kind of shied away from, but now I, in these interviews, I definitely feel a shift in terms of the willingness to talk about these things, which is probably because of how last year went. Well, yeah. <laughs> and well, really year before years before last year, I mean, you know, but last year, especially. And, um, yeah, there's definitely a shift there, um, which I think is great. And also, I guess we have to have people who are willing to kind of put themselves out there for the conversations to be had. And, with my first album, I wasn't really thinking about that. I just wanted to kind of prove myself as a guitarist. But after playing music and live and kind of being a professional musician for a few, a two years or whatever, however long now, um, I definitely feel like I kind of have a responsibility, I could say, to show where I'm from and how I think about things and how I think about my music. And um, yeah, just to showcase, I guess, kind of a, my unique standing in the genre if that makes sense like i don't want that to sound vain well i don't think it sounds vain at all but. i <laughs> but I, but i don't think it sounds vain i i wonder you know um that's a it's kind of like a heavy ask for you to like also be be the voice <laughs> like it's sort of not no not not on your part not a heavy ask on yours i'm talking in terms of uh, in terms of perception you know what i mean because because oh, like he, yeah because sure. here you, you're already like not only do you need to make the art the this art yeah. but then now you're also discussing so much more yeah. and sort of your <laughs> yeah. your place within the con like putting the art into context and it's difficult for me because it's just kind of processing enough to even put the album out and to get it written is a lot. Well, and then well, right. to find myself in these interviews, like discussing, <laughs> which I wasn't really, I didn't think about this before, like putting the album out. I was just like, you know, whatever. And now that I'm doing interviews about it, it's just like, whoa, I kind of have to think about this a bit more deeply. Has, has, <laughs> you know? has that been like a... Um... Has that been an exciting challenge on some some levels? Yeah, yeah, all levels. It's really exciting because it's. It, I I would have loved to have had this when I first started playing, like to be able to read interviews of someone discussing this. Yeah, no kidding, um, right? It would have been great. <laughs> so I I'll gladly do it. <laughs> do you think that in the case of um, the sort of solo guitar world, you know, um. Uh -huh. Yeah. Do, <laughs> that's, do, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, um, there, it, I mean, it depends on, on like sort of like what direction you come at it from, you know, uh, the solo guitar world is extremely strange. There's very, there's a lot of different, um, niche things and I just happen to overlap and intersect a lot of them. Right. So it's very, <laughs> it's, I've definitely noticed that <laughs> recently. Well, yeah, because it's like, it's like yeah. Well, well, because I mean, let's, uh, you know, uh, let's, let's even for, for one <laughs> second, set aside, set aside the blackness element of it. No, no, I wasn't even thinking about that Ex either. Yeah. It's like playing, playing just how I play. <laughs> well, know? exactly. And then you've got, you know, so, so it is, it is a, a very, as, as defined often, 
you know, white dude genre, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and to me, the, the unpacking of that history and, and recognizing the role that, um, that blackness played in the, in the very idea of it, you know, certainly, mm-hmm. uh, uh, American solo guitar or guitar sole or however you want to sort of put it, <laughs> you know, any of that stuff, mm-hmm. the history is, uh, is, of course intertwined with the history of blackness but that that's the same for for almost all american art forms you know and yep. so i think that the chance to have discussions about how all of this stuff contextualizes is such a cool moment for us to be yeah. able to talk about not just the music because the music's incredible you know but the music mm-hmm. is incredible because of its lineage and because of its history Thank you. yeah so so i feel like like it's a great moment and a great opportunity and in a in a year or two years where it has been very difficult to find anything like inspiration i think some of the conversations and something like your record it gives mm-hmm. us this really cool opportunity and it doesn't feel it, yeah. it feels to me like that's something worth celebrating among Thank all you. of the <laughs> the understandable heaviness and and the yeah. more painful side of things you know yeah thank you i really appreciate that i mean it was definitely i definitely had thoughts prior to the release of the album kind of, which were kind of like would this be not accepted, but would this be given the attention that I think it deserves in terms of all of the layers that go into the album? You know, I don't I don't want the discussion to just be like, oh, was she American Primitive, Fahey, or Wendell Mill, uh, whoever was on there? I mean, you know, yeah. which, is, which is a valid discussion to have. You know, I intersect, I guess, both of those. But yeah, I'm happy that the album is triggering a lot of discussion in terms of what yeah what you were just discussing i'm really happy with that that people are willing to have the conversation um well and it's great and that also that the canon itself in terms of what we think of as something can be stretched out and can be can be what yeah to, could be widened was, you know that was another concern yeah like i didn't know that's what i kind of meant by accepted in terms of like you know there's an obvious canon here and would my music be appreciated i guess since it doesn't really fit into that the specific canon that's been laid out yeah um yeah it's it's definitely refreshing to see um what people have thought about it and having this conversation has been especially refreshing well <laughs> well I, I i am so glad that we were able to do it and i'm so glad to be able to kind of get into this record because it really is it's 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 really a fun beautiful listen and i think it also thank you and the 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 great idea to me is that you know you know 50 or so years after this idea whatever Mm -hmm. sort of got named or codified or became something that it's still a tradition that's uh, you know, expansive and not yeah. and not so not so restrictive. And I feel like records like yours and records like uh, I mean all sorts of people that we've had on this show, you know, are, are really helping yeah. to 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 open open the the space up for other kinds of sounds and most importantly, all sorts of cool stories. So I really appreciate yeah, you sharing you. some of yours with us here on Transmissions. Yeah, I'm also happy with the record that a lot of people tend to, which is another reason I put Urban in the title. Um, another pe- uh, A lot of people tend to kind of associate Black music with kind of aggressiveness or, especially in 2020, <clears throat> a lot of, since so many horrible things were happening, I didn't really want to make, uh, the record's heavy, but I didn't want it to sound heavy. And I kind of wanted to thwart people's expectations a little bit like if you read the liner notes and read what it's about you're not really expecting what you hear um which is nice and i kind of just wanted to give people who wouldn't necessarily know this that you know black music has a lot of forms and it's not all you know just kind of one sounding thing and yeah yeah that was important too well you you did that and that's such a that's such a great note to close on um 
uh, this is an expansive record and it's about expansiveness and I think that that's a a truly uh, great achievement and so thanks so much I hope that we can talk again Thank sometime you. on the show it'd be really great to have you back yeah this was awesome thank you so much I really appreciate this that's gonna bring this week's episode to a close thanks so much for tuning in I'm Jason P. Woodbury. I write and produce transmissions. Our audio is edited by Andrew Horton. Jonathan Mark Walls creates video content. And our graphic designer is Sarah Goldstein. Justin Gage is Aquarium Drunkard's founder and our executive producer. We'll be back next week with another strange conversation for these strange times. So stay safe until then. We'll speak very soon.